Um, I thought what would be good is that maybe you could take us back because just so that people can understand uh, a little bit of like where you came from, kind of like your journey to black belt, because it's been like a, an, a, an epic tale. So can you enlighten the folks on how you got started in jujitsu and, and wh- where that led you? Uh, right. So I am currently a black belt in jujitsu. I just, um, past my fifth year anniversary, but I feel like I need a do over for at least one of those years, you know, cause we <laughs> haven't trained. Um, but yeah, so I started what I, I was a Krav Maga instructor and I was a yoga instructor. I think people forget the yoga thing because they only see me as violent. <laughs> um, I, wasn't, I wasn't aware of that. Really? Huh. Cut your tail. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> what you didn't assume that about me you are super mindful actually now that i think about it <laughs> yeah so that's what i was doing at the time and um i guess like a couple of different things i think jujitsu found me so that was what 2010 um there was a heap of things like i was doing krav maga and i got messed up by somebody that took my back and choked me out you know like um that hadn't trained for very long at all. And I thought I was the, the shit in Krav Maga. Like, I think a lot of people do in Krav Maga, you know, cause you think it's been tested, like because of your drills and stuff, you think it's tested and you think um, it's reality training because it's hard training. Um, and I don't know, like, I don't know. I was part of that as well. So like when I see martial arts that like jujitsu people are all snobby with and go, you know, that doesn't work or whatever. And how could people believe that? I, I'm one of those people that believed, you know, like, and I, I do believe that Krav Maga has a, like, a place in the world, but like, yeah, it wasn't as real as I thought. If somebody that had like six weeks of jujitsu training could choke me out and I was the chick touring, you know, like around the place to show off I was just to show off Krav Maga, like it kind of falls apart there. Like, so that had happened. What else had happened? I just, was teaching you both. Yeah. In, defense, in defense of Krav Maga, just for one second there. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it like, like, say, yeah, someone took you back and choked you out, but like if you had a knife in your hand, you would have like stabbed the shit out of them, right? Yeah. So it's like, so it's like, well, what sort of violence are we talking about? Yeah, jiu-jitsu wins within the context of jiu-jitsu. No, no weapons. No weapons. We're rolling on the mats. But if it's yeah. like, hey, anything goes, grab a fucking stick, grab a brick. I got this but knife. Like, in my, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. To- totally agree. But like the scenario that I was in, I was in a cage with three people. One person had a weapon and I just had to survive for two minutes and I wasn't capable of doing that. So like given the scenario, like mm, it's not really a scenario that you're going to get in, but it's like, like, don't get me wrong. Krav Maga training is like super fun. Like that kind of thing. Like if either of you guys had been given that opportunity, it's fun. Like we had things like, you're in the training room, get to the bathroom and back without getting stabbed. It's super fun. Like, because you're not going <laughs> to die. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's really fun just to see what you can do, you know, like given kind of a confined, like safe environment, you know, but like I wasn't able to do that. And I had to then question my own like training and what I was saying, like, if I can't survive two minutes, given that I'm selling this to people, like it's just, for me, I needed to question it. For other people, maybe they don't. No problems, you know. But for me, it wasn't enough to, like, not feel safe, you know. Like, um, And where did that lead you? Like, where did you go from there? Well, so that happened. But also at the same time, I was teaching um, yoga on the third floor of, uh, an, uh, like, a little office block thing in Little Burke Street in the city of Melbourne. Yes, and for most people that, like... Um, no Melbourne and most people my generation of black belts <laughs> um actually trained at ground zero so ground zero was across the alleyway from my yoga class so I'm like eh. <laughs> like, <laughs> and like as my class is like folded over I'm looking across an alleyway at Megan Green training with all these dudes right so I just see this redhead chick and I'm like <laughs> given my ego at the time, I'm like, I reckon I can take it. <laughs> and it's not like bad, you know, like, but that was my ego. So like I saw them training and like, so that kind of happened at the same time. MMA was sort of like becoming more popular, like just around the place. And at the time I was, mm, I guess a little bit more interested in a shallow pool. Like, so like, like that same ego that saw Megan and was like, I reckon I could beat her. I was pretty convinced if somebody just let me have a turn at MMA, I'd win it. 
like I was wrong, but it's just that like, you know, that thing of like people that haven't been in a street fight and they're like, I reckon when it comes down to it, like I'm going to be, I'm going to be all right. And it's like, oh, cool. Like, <laughs> yeah, you're not. So like, I can punch them. Oh, it did. Yeah. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> yeah. So I sort of like, no, I had a lot of that in me of like, if somebody just let like fluffy off the chain, maybe I'd get a, like I'd be good, you know? And so all of that sort of converged and yeah, I like one of the nights that I came out of yoga, there was three massive dudes standing out the front of uh, ground zero downstairs. And I asked them if they trained upstairs and that ended up being Chad, Marty and Josh. So wow. Marty is my black belt and like has been my best mate and like, you know, everything to me in my jiu-jitsu journey all along. So they were the first people I spoke to and uh, Josh is now a brown belt under me, under me and Chad is now a purple belt under me. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Well, and Marty. And Marty. It's <laughs> not just me. But shit. Yeah. So they were the first guys that I met. Um, yeah. And that was, that's where it all started. And now, yeah, I like have toured the world many times. Um, I'm a black belt. I'm very proud of that black belt. I'm a good black belt, which makes me proud as well. Um, yeah. And I'm a, the head of Australian Girls and Gee, which is something I'm extremely proud of. So like that's beginning. That's, that's, where we've ended now in there's lockdown well, there's, and not well, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of steps that were skipped there, Jess Fraser. <laughs> like, yeah. let's, maybe we can rewind a little. And yeah, go, sure. Obviously, the journey to Black Belt isn't always a, a straight path. And Absolutely. both Joe and I have taken different dips and turns and all of that. But you yeah. have been a competitor. That's yeah. you know, it's not everybody's path, right? But you have competed at all the various levels and thrown down many various peoples. Can yeah. you speak to a little bit of getting in there and smashing it up? Yeah, so um, my first coach, um, so like we'd been training pretty hard, you know, so back in the day, we'd all been training pretty hard. Um, and I like voiced that I wanted to do the pan packs, but I said it as, hey, I want to come to the pan packs. And my first coach said to me, oh, that's good. So like you could do like sandwiches and stuff or like if you wanted to order Subway. And I was like, what? what? Like, what is this? And he genuinely thought I wanted to go as like a mascot or something. So I, Such a yeah, t- that, that inspired like a, a six year career really. <laughs> so just like, I don't know, like, uh, wanting to prove a point, I guess, was a, a big thing. Um, when I started competing, so Megan was in my team at Ground Zero. She had just won all four golds at White Belt um, at the Pan Packs. And so he'd moved her to Blue Belt and I came in as White Belt, whatever. And I just thought it was stock standard that you just went and won all four gold. Like, she did it. What Like, that's just what you do, you know? Like, so... Yeah, we went to the Pan Packs and, like, I didn't really want my blue belt, like, in those days because at that point, the Pan Pacific Championships for women was merged blue to black. <laughs> <laughs> so terrible. So good. So what bad. is that? Imagine that open weight, like, as a fresh blue. Like, what? what is that? It's stupidest. Like, anyway, so she went into to blue belt and I did white belt and won three three golds and a silver. That came second in the, in the open weight in Nogi. So... Yeah, I don't know. Like I just, that started there and then I made it a point for every year to win all four golds at all belt levels until black, I haven't done black belt in Australia because I don't want to, but um, Pan Packs, Vicks, any states I could get to, nationals, I, like it was, it just became a goal to do all four of everything. And yeah, I don't know. Like I guess at the time because there wasn't like a lot of women around, to me, like being like, kind of trailblazers with this stuff. Like the only person I had to look up to was Soph and Soph was overseas winning the brown black merge division at Pans. Pans. We're talking Sophia McDermott. McDermott. Yeah. So Soph McDermott, um, like before her, there was Stacey Cartwright that had come like second at ADCC, which people don't remember. And Jean Alves that like came third at ADCC at the big show, you know, like, so people don't remember that stuff and they're not aware of it. Um, just because, the internet wasn't the same, you know, but for me, that meant that like, so 
Soap was a friend and a mentor and, um, and is. Um, and she'd gone over, it used to be merged brown to black. Like, so the belts like kind of slowly like separated for women at like local and international comps. Um, yeah. And so Soap had won Pan Ams at Brown Belt when it was brown black merged. So she has it as a brown belt title, but she won the black belt division, you know, which like, yeah. it's pretty epic, like considering yeah. what was going on and she came out of Australia. Right. So like that for me, I just saw, thought was standard. Like, so I was training a lot with Liv. I was training a lot with Megan. We just did that, you know, like, so as soon as I got my blue belt, we were going international and then a whole bunch of women watched us go international and like, Blue belt, I fought so many times and it was like, like at Worlds, I like had so many matches and it was one of the first ones that was televised for us back here or you could see it on YouTube or something. So people watched it and it just like, I don't know, it started this thing with Australian women that we'd go to Worlds and everyone would expect us to bring medals back. Like there was a group of us that that happened for a while. Chantelle, Fiona, me, Liv, like it just was happening, you know, it was really bizarre. But like we just normalize that amongst our, our crew. <laughs> and then you come back to the VIX and you've got to fight a fucking world champion. Like, great. <laughs> you know, it was, it was a bizarre time. Yeah. It was really fun. Yeah. And then it led up to black belt, which was, yeah, I got to compete as a black belt too, which was fun. Yeah. yeah. And I guess, um, you know, speaking around that, there's a big piece of your journey or your story, I guess, is the leadership point around, girls and gay because that's become yeah. quite an institution and a, a community which you know you founded and, and have led can you mm. talk uh, about how how that came about and how that's kind of evolved to be where it is yeah so like i guess the first thing especially because you've got american listeners the first thing i should clarify is we're australian girls in geese that s is important to me <laughs> so at the same time me and i think it's shamana is her name another woman started in 2010 like we didn't know like we didn't know that we'd both grow into something huge but she started girls in gi in in america and i started australian girls in geese because you know alliteration if i had the choice again or alliteration if I had the choice again, I wouldn't put the word girls in there, but it was like, you know, like it was back in the day. I didn't know. Like, I, I just didn't know that I'd become something with it and I didn't know it would be big and probably she didn't either. Like, I don't know, like you just named it a catchy name. So it's important that people know that like we're a different thing and we do a very different thing. They like focus on um, more uh, charity, like fundraising and stuff. And we focus much more on bringing Australia together as a community because we can in Australia bring the country together. Whereas America's quite like everybody's doing their own thing, you know? So um, that's important for me to explain. But just check it out on, online. You'll be able to see that there's a bit of a difference in what we do. And she does great things. I do great things. They're just different. Um, yeah, so Australian Girls and Geeks started because I wasn't allowed to train with Kate Wilson. So Kate was Sia Polista and I was ground zero and both of our coaches, like, so we'd fought at the ADCC trials and I'd beaten Kate, but I knew she was better at jiu-jitsu than me. So I wanted to train with her. And um, her coach said, yes, but if she comes here and my coach said the same thing, but they wouldn't let us train at each other's like gyms, you know, which like side note, get over it boys. Like just so stupid, you know, like, because Kate also is an incredible representative for Australia and went on to, like, make history with, like, I think she did, like, hit the podium a couple of times at Brown Belt and stuff at Worlds. Like, she's really, really good, you know? And, like, Abu Dhabi Pro Tour and stuff like that in Japan, she's been amazing. So, um, and she's a black belt in Adelaide now. So, I wanted to train with her. It was as simple as that. And, um, yeah, I just, like, I definitely drew on the the woman card it was like, oh, but we girls, we need to hang out. <laughs> That's like, it's bullshit. But like, yeah. So I made a flag for us to fly under so we could actually train together. And then that was working for us. And then very quickly, like Liv was down there with us. Sunny was down there with us. Uh, Jen, um, 
Tolhurst was no Jen Torrance was down there with us so like every girl that was representing Australia internationally and doing really well like Sunny went on to fight um, Michelle Nicolini like that year or the year after you know like so at Abu Dhabi um, in the purple to black division you know so those girls that were getting together we were also like going on to represent Australia and bring back medals and make history you know so like to me it like was very clearly valuable and I wanted to share that with other people. And I did it as a like charity, like a donation of my time for about five years and then realized that it was worth um, people paying me for that service. So shifted into that space when I became a black. Yeah. Yeah. Fair play. Yeah. Did you realize at the time the, the potential that it had and the significance of what you were doing, or is it kind of now upon reflection that that comes to, that you realize that? Oh, like no idea at the time. I just like at the time, like, I mean, it's a lot like your jujitsu journey, right? Like, you know, and, and I speak to us as a group as black belts, cause Joey believe that you're in that space, you know, like, thank you. I believe he's not, but you can say that. <laughs> <laughs> you're not allowed to say nice things, <laughs> but yeah, like, so I, I, I think it's like the jujitsu journey. You don't realize like at a white belt, you just don't want to be a white belt at blue belt. You're like, I'm a badass. Like you're just kind of focusing on the thing at the time. You don't realize that that blue belt story from worlds is something you're going to be telling on a podcast, like 10 years later, you know, like you, there's, there's no way you can know within it um, and stay be like, humbleness oofs you know like <laughs> if i knew at the time like i probably wouldn't have what i have because no one would want to be around me you know like it definitely was very organic and yeah like it it genuinely grew with me like i've made some crazy mistakes with australian girls and gay and had some like crazy successes but it, it grew with me like it, it, when i was a blue belt you know the camp <laughs> the camp i was running had a comp in it so like now it's nothing like that at all. It's like a, it's a community vibe and we all hang out. Well, no, different camps do different things. Yeah. Big camp is community vibe. The smaller camps are like technique focused, whatever. But there was a camp that I was trying to do it all. I was like, what can I value add? You know, like, so I got a whole bunch of women together, made them sleep on mats next to each other and made them fight the next day. <laughs> like, <laughs> can, you, <laughs> can you imagine like the tension of going to sleep that night? You don't even know who you're fighting. You don't know these women. They've come from all over Australia. <laughs> like, what did you get hurt? Yeah. Like, everybody <laughs> pull out that crop and gun knife and just stick them. Chop a reed, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> wake up the next day. After. Awful. <laughs> like, what are they meant to do with that? You know, like, I just think about how stressful that is. But that was what I was going through. Like, I was stressing myself out competing at Worlds and stuff. And, like, jiu-jitsu for me was tense. So, like, I brought that energy into the camps and to Aegi then. Like, and I really think, like, I've been looking at a lot of the photos lately, you know, like, because you do in a, in a lockdown situation and reminisce. And, like, you can really clearly see the change of my energy over the years in those photos and when I'm having fun and when I'm not, you know, like, so yeah, like I, yeah, I didn't have any clue that it was going to have impact. I think back then now, like, I don't know, the, the moments that really hit me is when I see a little girl that I like, I swear, I don't know her or her parents or like, I don't know them. And she's wearing either a t-shirt or a rashi or a, a patch, you know, I'm like, wow. Like, so she's 10. So Australian girls and gee is older than her at this point. Uh -huh. And yep. so the world doesn't exist without a gig to her. Like it's just normal that there's a whole bunch of like totally like boss women cruising around like, and she thinks they're cool. Like, what is that? You know, like I didn't even know about martial arts until I was like 30, you know, or 27. Yeah. 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 So that, yeah, I didn't know at the time, but it's, it's pretty cool now. I'm very proud of it now. More proud of it than medals. Like I've got pictures up in here of, of Aggie, but not of my medals. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, look, I, I guess the, the thing that goes with all of this and the, the hard thing with jujitsu longevity is injuries. And <laughs> you, Jess Fraser, you had a couple. <laughs> Could we do uh, that? <laughs> get you we, you know obviously we've got a time limit on this uh, podcast but um <laughs> could we get you to maybe have a little mention about some of the more significant injuries you had the noteworthy 
the story ones and when and kind of how they happened? Uh, yeah, so... Um, your highlight reel, your best, your top... Your top the three. highlight reel. Well, like, there's always your first big one that shocks the shit out of you, yeah? Um, I, like, I had a bunch of things, like, you know, black eyes. I had a black eye that just moved around my face, my whole blue belt, you know? Like, it just was there <laughs> the whole time. And, you know, like, it's those beginning things when you break a couple of fingers at the beginning or a toe or a rib or whatever it is. There's those things. But the, the first one that really stopped me on my tracks, like, had to, like, buy machinery to, like, hold me together was my LCL at Purple Belt. And that happened in 50-50 because I just didn't even know what it was at the time. Um, that sucked. And so that was the first time that I was like in a knee brace or whatever. And that was the first time I actually like even learned about rehab and stuff. At the time I went to Murray Ballenden. Yep. Um, yeah. A strong, his, a strong room. Is that his thing? Yeah. I don't know whether he runs it anymore. Like I actually haven't spoken to him in ages, but uh, I went through him and I like was, yeah, I was in a leg brace. So like it was the first time that I was learning like, um, like, straight leg deadlift kind of stuff like that sort of vibe like to heal that so that was like rudimentary but just got me through i was in a leg brace for a long time um i was in it for too long and then the week that i was meant to take it off i heard it again in the shower which stupid so i was in it again and looking back i wouldn't go into one of those things you know um and then bits and pieces, whatever. And then the big one, I guess, that people know about because it was pretty dramatic is I ruptured my bicep at Brown Belt. And that was the year that JT and I started working together. So I did that in February of 2016 um, when I was on like a total tear. Like I really, I was in good shape to like just blitz everything at Brown Belt, you know? Like I'd done really well at Purple and like, yeah, I was in really good shape. I was quite young then. <laughs> I was really fit. And I got um, ready to go. I sold everything, like, packed it up, packed up my relationship, packed up everything that I had and, like, entered Pan Am's, Worlds, Abu Dhabi World Pro, like, everything you possibly could. And then I ruptured my bicep in the first two weeks of being gone. So that sucked. And um, it took me, like, so that was February... 2016 and then you and I JT started working together like I think the end of that year yeah. so I hadn't done a lot of work on fixing that um that side and I actually ended up coming to you because I hurt myself I hurt the other bicep <laughs> and I was like I'd really like to keep one of them <laughs> like, <laughs> you know? because like I wasn't too happy with like for those of you that don't know like when you rupture a bicep it's like at my age it's a decision whether you get the surgery or not to repair it and um yeah it, it get, comes down a lot to cosmetics and it looks really unsightly I don't love it but you know it is what it is um and I just really didn't want that on both sides so um yeah I was in deep half with a hundred, do you know that um, Ryan guy up at Flow or something in? Yeah. Yeah. I was in deep half with him because oh, I'm. That guy. I'm <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> like, and playing it poorly, right? Like, so I grabbed his thigh, like those of you that understand jiu-jitsu will be able to picture this. And I was trying to like roll his, like his thigh up onto my shoulder. So I just comported <laughs> the shit out of myself and hurt my own bicep so I came to you at that like that was actually what the problem was and you were down in Melbourne and we fixed that and then I got like a little cocky and just with no preparation whatsoever entered the Abu Dhabi trials um <laughs> we, and yeah won the trials and then we got ready for Abu Dhabi World Pro which was nice <laughs> and yeah so that's been like I guess the major one was getting past the bicep stuff. Then I got ran over by a car. That yeah. sucked. <laughs> Ridiculous. And I got, Ridiculous. yeah, that was rough. Hang on, just, like, so just, just unpack that a fraction. Just, so you're on your bike. So just, I was on my bicycle. I was riding to training and. Um, you taped you, right? <laughs> what's that? You had a gi, right? With you? In I had several gis in my bag so um, I'm actually wearing Jesse's t-shirt 
I had gone over to Singapore, no, I'd gone over to Vegas and then Singapore to help Jesse prep for like, Jesse Jess, prep for one of her UFC fights um, and corner her. And one of the things I'm really proud of that I got as a corner man is there's a corner man bag, like a UFC corner man bag, which you'll see me rocking around with. And it's not that I'm like, like a tap out wearing kind of gal. It's just that I really <laughs> have that corner man bag, you know, like, cause you only get it if you do that. So I have, there's like the gym in Richmond. It's like, you know, two Ks from my house. So I ride back and forward and I have the, the geese that you wash for the guys that do trial classes. So I had a bag full of geese, like a massive bag full of geese. Like it's, it's bigger than me. I look like a turtle. And I was riding to training and I was crossing a uh, roundabout. So I totally had right of way and like somebody just mowed me down, like totally mowed me down. So I went under the wheel well, like the bike went like kind of up and under the wheel well and I got like sucked under the car and it just, it totally sucked. But the cool thing about it with like training and stuff is like, I didn't break limbs, you know, like, so the car hit me from the side and I had like, my hands on the car and I like, I've always imagined if I got hit by a car, like it'd be like, like, <laughs> you know, and I'd fly. but it's, it, it, it wasn't that like he hit my bike from the side and everything slows down because of adrenaline. And I was yelling at him and it just didn't stop. It's like when you get like smashed by a wave, like it just doesn't stop. And it was like, he, it just kept moving and like, I wasn't going anywhere because the bike went under the wheel. So I couldn't go anywhere. I was like sort of essentially pinned to the ground, but because of jujitsu, I put my hands on the vehicle rather than out on the ground, you know, like, so I put my hands on the vehicle and uh, it's like defending a single leg. <laughs> so stupid. But that's, that's totally what happened. <laughs> Which also meant that I tucked my chin towards like that side, you know, towards my shoulder. So I didn't hit my head and yeah, I didn't break my shoulders, didn't break my collarbones, didn't like none of that happened. But went under the car, so I was pinned like like under the car, the bike, <laughs> bike me car. Guys that are just listening to this won't be able to understand what I'm doing. But like I was squished, you know, like underneath there. And he stopped and I was between the front wheel and the and the back wheel. So because of that, I kind of folded backwards over my bag, but the bag was this great big pillow, you know, because it was full of geese. So jujitsu literally saved my life. <laughs> so <laughs> not the way I was expecting it to, <laughs> you know. And like I was totally fine, no like loss of skin, nothing, which is just insane. Like if you had seen the bike, you know, like and even when we went down to the hospital and stuff, they were just like, this doesn't, this doesn't happen, you know, like. It just was incredible what happened, but I got uh, bulging discs. So where I like, I twisted, like I essentially, like if you think like rotate off to the side to look at like, look in your, your right pocket, that's where I was. And then I got squashed back or oh, no, sorry, the other way. Yeah. And then I got squashed back. So like, yeah, bulging discs, which makes sense. Um, and again, like, so I had to treat the acute injury, but then I ended up um, working with JT and we did some really smart stuff. I, like, I was so impressed with what we did. But one of the coolest things when we finally, like, worked up to, like, deads and stuff is we stopped me from doing split grip deads because my grip would fail before, like, if I'm doing, like, double overhand, my grip's going to fail before my back did. And I really enjoy that, you know, like, and I still use that to this day is like my safety. Like, so yeah, we did, I mean, we did so much cool work and we did really cool stuff, but that injury like just isn't even really a thing in my life now. Like we don't even think about it. Same with my bicep. We don't even really think about it. So that's all been really cool. And like, I guess one of the things that like working with UJT has been like really fun for me is that I used to think rehab was like a punish, but in our rehab, I'm, doing strength and conditioning work. I'm doing the work that I wanted to do anyway, you know, and I'm learning skills that I wanted to learn anyway. And it's just been, you know, it's always been enjoyable. I just feel like I'm strength working, but we are doing like injury, like prevention and, and dealing with stuff. Anyway, so that was probably the, the last, oh no, of course. <laughs> so after the last lockdown, um, yeah, like I, came back guns blazing and was just like so stupid excited to train because I hadn't rolled for 100 all? Weren't we all? 
Well, oh, yeah. Well, it's like, frothing. Dude, I didn't do any, and I'm still not doing any of those, like, sneaky lockdown roles. So, for me, it was 108 days between roles, which was, like, significant because yoga instructor and revolutions around the sun and all that kind of stuff. But, like, I just started, like, was just training nonstop. And I felt good, and I was training with different people, and it just, like, yeah, it was it was a big deal and I kind of put it ahead of everything and I've stacked all of my cards poorly in that way because it wasn't strength training. And, yeah, so it was about three months before my knee exploded. <laughs> and that was, yeah, that was the last big injury and that was October last year. Um, yeah, and I came straight to JT again and was like, <laughs> I've broken my toy. <laughs> We did a lot of work and now I'm, yeah, back to, to 100%, which is really fun. Mm. Ready, ready to burst out of lockdown again. Only to apply your new injury and then get you back. <laughs> I am lifting this time. I'm doing it better. I'm doing it better. JT, at the beginning of this lockdown, phoned me. And he doesn't phone me often and he's like, hey, so uh, MA1 are having a sale on kettlebells. <laughs> Subtle. <laughs> Here's the link. <laughs> yes. I guess so, yeah. the cool thing relevant to that is since I've moved to Sydney and you're in, you know, the gong, mm. uh, you have been able to come up to Jungle Brothers. So you've been able to see Joe and yeah, get, so nice. get around and you met Tiora and, and Paulie. Yeah. And, so you've been able to do Bulletproof at Jungle Brothers, which has yes. kind of been a nice tie-in as well. Yeah. Because yeah, it's really before, good. Yeah. before it was just you and me, and now you get a chance to connect with yeah. the, the Joe Bro. It's so nice. It's really one of my favorite things to do. I miss it a lot. Yeah, and it was cool. Like you were coming up here, training here, JB's coming over to Alliance, training there. Like that was kind of, I guess I hadn't had a lot to do with you sort of previous to that. And then, all of a sudden, sort of in a space of a few months, was like, we're hanging out all the time. It was really nice. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, look, you're just JT in Sydney, so you're going to be my best friend. <laughs> and <laughs> then somehow I manifested JT moving to Sydney as well. So, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> it's worked out well for me. <laughs> I mean, I think it's worked out well for all of us. But, uh, I got a question about, about your black belt. Something that I noticed um, from your a lot from your social media, but also how you talk. We've had you, you know, we've spoken a lot, had you been on the Jungle Brothers podcast and um, yeah. something that's really nice about how you talk about jujitsu is how much you love your black belt and how much you appreciate it. And yeah. you, you kind of have, the, you, you hold it with this sort of great reverence. And yeah. it's something that I find a lot of people in, and this is kind of, you know, coming from me who's sort of, you know, hopefully on the cusp of getting it soon. Um, the I see a lot of people who get it, but it's like when they get it, they almost, I don't know if it's a feeling of like, um, I don't know if it's a humility thing or whatever, but people all of a sudden like stop talking about it. And there's very, it's like, oh, you've got my black belt, like no big deal, you know? And it's like, dude, you've been yeah. trying to get that thing for like a decade or yeah. two. Yeah. Like it's a fucking yeah. big deal, but people are like, oh yeah, you know, and it's kind of part of that, you know, once you get to black belt, you realize how fucking much you don't know right yeah. um, but I find you're quite unique in how you have that narrative about it can you speak to that um I think my belt is really important like it's important to me and it's important to a bunch of other people you know like um stepping into this space as a woman in Jiu-Jitsu is just like, it's a huge deal and not many people did it before me. In fact, only 11 women from Australia did before me, you know, like, and uh, yeah, like I, I, I gave up a lot for it, you know, like you don't have to give up a lot for Jiu-Jitsu or for the black belt, but like I made choices in my life to, to get that, you know, like some people make choices to build a family and actively pursue that or a house or whatever it is, that was my thing. And for that reason, I'm always going to be excited that I got it, you know, like it means a lot to me. It's not just like, it's not a little thing, <laughs> like it's not a little thing. And 
there were so many reasons for me to not get it, you know, and to defy those odds or to like shut up naysayers to me also was really, really important. Um, I think it's also important for the women, my, my journey and putting myself into a leadership role and putting myself into a vocal space um, in jiu-jitsu, it's important that I do honour it because if I behave like it's just like whatever, what are the girls that are looking at me going to think, you know? Like you don't really get to, as a trailblazer, you don't really get to have that kind of attitude, you know? And I look forward to the privilege of the girls behind me that do, that are like, oh, whatever. Now I'm going to get my other black belt, you know? Like I actually like that idea. It's cool because that will mean that we're saturated, you know? Like, and that means that it's more normalised that women have black belts. So I don't really, there's a lot of things that I would like to do or say. Um, it's not that I'm being disingenuous or whatever, but there's a lot of things that I would like to do or say or behave like. <laughs> And I don't know whether I'm afforded that luxury or I don't think it's the right thing for me to do given the position that I've chosen to have the honour of having, you know? Yeah. And yeah. for, for the, the women who are out there, I mean, I mean, I think, you know, plenty of men can learn from your example, but, you know, having been the vocal person you are and the strong leader you are, and there's yeah. been around the world because we've got more people listening to us overseas, is there some advice that you could give to your younger self on the journey to the black belt? Or is there any advice that you would give to some up and coming hardcore or harder blue belt women out there <laughs> getting after it similar to yourself? Is there any kind of sage words you could share? Oh, look, there's so much I could say. Um, the biggest thing is you're a hundred percent valid. And your journey is totally valid. And someday somebody is going to be asking you about it. And even though you just did what you thought was right at the time, people are going to look to it as sage advice, you know, like it's all right to make mistakes and it's all right to tell people to fuck off. That's <laughs> <laughs> At least here in Australia it is. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, speaking to that, you know, to very early on to um, uh, leaders and black belts very close to me told me that I needed to clean up my language because no one would take me seriously if I swore. And to this day, I don't police my voice in that way. In fact, I do it on purpose because the way that I speak and people like, tone policing you or telling you what you can do or what you can say or whatever, like, fuck off. I'm still good at jujitsu, you know, like, mm -hmm. and I still contributed to community. And if the one thing you want to do is either tell me what to wear or say or do or whatever, that's just another form of like holding people down, you know, like, so I do it on purpose. Like, I'm never going to change that. Like it's actually in there because people told me I wouldn't be taken seriously or I wouldn't be taken professionally. <laughs> I didn't clean that up. Like does my work not speak anything to you? Oh, okay, cool. I'll wear a dress for you too. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's cool. Yeah. It's really good. All right. Yes. Well, I think that's, that's a great note for us to leave off on. Um, obviously lovely to see your smiling face and hopefully. Yeah, you guys too. Missing you guys. We will get a chance to get together again very soon. Yeah, for but, sure. Uh, final notes from you, Joe? No, not at all. I um, I think yeah, there's so much. There's so much we could talk about, and and obviously, um, we touched on just parts of it today. We'll do it again down the track and go deeper in bits. But I do, I do really like the. I do ha like how your sort of your steez cuts across the grain of of the convention, and you you are a bit outspoken. And I like how you're carving your own path through jujitsu and the, the A gig thing. And um, yeah, I think it's fucking awesome. So, you know, well done and, and glad that we can like whatever, be around and be a part of that somehow. Yeah. Yeah. You guys are a massive help, massive help. And you know, like the biggest accolades on my wall are definitely there because JT helped me get there, you know, like, so it's a big deal for me and you guys are very important to me. Bulletproof is very important to me. I'm so proud that I'm the first guest. It's like, whew, made me blush. <laughs> That's the best. <laughs>
I'll send you the plaque. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I love it. I consider it just my healthy knees, the plaque. <laughs> yeah, those, those pistols. Oh, we love it. Yeah. You, Jess, appreciate you and definitely looking forward to the next time when we can do it again. Right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Jess. See you.